All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so today, um, I'm happy to introduce to all of you our AI seminar speaker, Dr. Julian Yarconi, who is a senior scientist in AI and machine learning with uh, the Verisk AI team. And he leads Verisk's research on the application of combinatorial optimization and operations research method methodologies to computer vision and machine learning problems. He got his PhD in computer science from the University of California, Irvine, and also did a postdoc at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So today he will tell us about principled multi-person pose estimation using column generation and nested benders decomposition. Thank Welcome. you. Oh, thank you so much for coming. It's an absolute delight to be back home in California. I've spent almost my entire adult life here, so just back home, Southern California, it's beautiful. So grateful to be here. <laughs> so. Well, hey, we're going to have the video forever. I also pretend that part wasn't there. <laughs> uh, but just want to express my gratitude. Uh, so today we're going to be learning about some real gems in operations research, which is the field which brings us vehicle routing, uh, brings us crew scheduling, uh, materials cutting. But we're going to see how these gems can be taken and applied to problems in computer vision, which is a little strange of a statement if you think about it. That's like saying, I'm going to take everything I know about fish and apply it to bicycle design. <laughs> they don't have anything to do with each other, so people told me, but I disagreed, and we've been able to demonstrate that, yes, they have a lot to do with each other. So what my group does at uh, Veris. So we apply operations research methods, operations research meaning the science of, say, vehicle routing, crew scheduling, uh, uh, stock cutting computer vision problems. I'm going to show you some of my favorite problems. So this is the problem of multi-person pose estimation. So given an image, we're going to identify every unique person in the image and, and annotate their body parts. So you can see over here, this yellow dot, yellow, yellow, corresponds to the right foot. Green head, green head, green head, corresponds to the top of your head. This is one of them. That's the law application we're going to actually see discussed today. My, one of my other favorite applications is multi-object tracking. In this problem, the goal is to take in a video and then identify each unique person in the image as they, for the video, and then follow them as they move across space-time. Uh, Multi-instance segmentation. Uh, so this is for, say, biological cells, or also for uh, entity resolution, which we wrote a paper on very recently, or also called deduplication of records. Uh, the goal here is to take in an image and to identify each unique cell in the image. In all these problems, we don't know how many objects are present in the image. We don't know, but well, we certainly don't know if this is John or Jane or Steve or Bill, much less in this case, cells are, in, are identical often, or uh, certainly there's no uh, explicit, we know that this cell has a name or anything like that. It makes it a lot harder. Uh, and then of course, hierarchical clustering, uh, this is producing a course to find uh, segmentation of an image, which is useful in downstream pipelines in computer vision. I'm surprised you're not mentioning like sports. That could be very, you know, applying to videos of sports to attract players and everything. That would be a good thing to look into. We can go look into that together if you'd like. No, but I know there's a company that's come out of ISI. Oh, forget the names. But they, that's what they're doing. They try, well, maybe from overhead videos, but they're trying to like track players, not really pause, but I think they're just on the field, you know, track players and basketball field, you know. Well, we should give them my paper, because we have code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they might, uh, we also have, we have patents. We have, we have patents, too. <laughs> we can make some money off this. Exactly. Cool. I'll, so, I will try to look the, remember absolutely. the name. Absolutely. And, and feel free to interrupt me at any time. I mean, there's a lot of concepts here that are new, and, uh, you know, just no shame in missing this stuff. I had to go through these papers that I found relevant papers dozens of times before I could really start understanding what's going on. So now let's go into multi-person pose estimation, the challenge. This is one of my favorite problems. I'm going to start off by making a very broad statement, almost too broad, and then we're going to make it concrete. So like the fundamental dogma of my research, like the one sentence explanation of what I do. Explain the observed data points in some data sets by partitioning or packing. Packing meaning you're going to throw out some of these, say they're false observations, into separate coherent hypotheses that respect what real data looks like. 
So, and respects, of course, Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the right one. So now let's go into what that means in the context of multi-person pose estimation. I'm going to plug the blue for the blue, the green for the green, and the red for the red. Explain the observed detections of body parts as generated by a deep neural network by partitioning or packing, meaning some of these detections are false. This and we don't have a, the neural network is not infallible. It makes mistakes. It produces some spurious detections into separate coherent people that respect what real people look like. You know, people tend to have uh, a head. They tend to have uh, feet that are above the, below their below their head. So, so that's the concept here. So why is this problem hard? Well, there are a lot of reasons that this is hard, some of which are less obvious than others. So first, people have taken different body positions. They have what uh, the, the action that they're taking really can govern how they appear. Clothing covers up most of their pixels. So like if you see me, you know, almost all my pixels are black and I have a head. <laughs> so uh, also, this is a really sadistic problem, occlusion. You see right here, she's occluding a huge part of this guy. Poor guy, he's being locked out of the picture. But she's also self-occluding. Her hand is occluding her own shoulders. It'd be really great if everybody were uh, stood like this. And I won't make the other comment because it's 2019. But it would certainly make human detection and pose estimation a lot easier. Another problem, this one is one I did not know about. It was my student, Xiaofei Wang, who really emphasized to me how important this problem is. Uh, Non-max suppression is hard. So this neural network, in this example, generated multiple detections of this guy's left shoulder. Oh, right, right to us, it's left to him. Yeah. But look at multiple detections. And it's not, so you think, okay, I just can get rid of, get rid of them. They're so close together. So fast, it's not that easy because you can have two heads in close proximity. You don't know the number of people in the image, that's another problem. And much less you don't know their identities. I take a random image. I do, it's not like I'm looking for Steve and Joe and Bill. I just say, oh, looking for people. So these are some of these really sadistic problems that get in the way of multi-person pose estimation. And of course, you know, these days, this is the era of deep learning, deep nets are good at generating lots of hypotheses by searching over all the windows, all the possible bounding boxes in the image and identifying how good uh, this candidate looks at or looks for producing a person. But it can't enforce the packing property. It can't. Uh, it can't uh, limit your number. It's not easy to limit your number of uh, people produced to a to a non-overlapping subset to actually explain the image. So, and certainly not done in a principled manner. So that's where we come in: is we're taking the deep learning stuff and then the combinatorial optimization and bringing them together. <clears throat> so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go discuss what the cost of any single person is. Now I should emphasize, because whenever I give this talk, people think that this is the final equation that I'm optimizing. That's not true. <laughs> so the cost, we're in this page, and this we're gonna discuss the set of all possible people in the image, and we're gonna discuss how to assign a cost to any single one of them. So we're gonna use big D to denote the set of detections. <coughs> and we're gonna use uh, big G to denote the set of all possible persons. And I want to emphasize that this is the power set of D. This is the set of every possible person. And of course, uh, I should emphasize, so I should add that this, the person, including zero detections, has cost zero. You know, it's not really a person. But uh, this set is the power set of D. Well, wait, what does that mean? Does that mean I could have two heads? Well, yes. Remember, I showed you that last slide. That sadistic problem of non-max suppression. So it's best to think of this problem as any possible member of the power set of detections is a conceivable person. It may be a really one that's not supported by the data in the image, but it is one that is a member of this set G. We can never write this set down. You see that all over operations research. They talk about the set of all possible vehicle routes, the set of all possible cruise schedules, the set of all possible cutting patterns. In all of those cases, you cannot write that entire set down. So how can I solve optimization over it? 
Well, they do it all the time. And that, that sounds really strange to us in computer vision machine learning. How can you optimize over functions that you can't write down? Well, it turns out you can. We're actually going to see that. Uh, so, well, I'm going to emphasize that we never write this set down. Gee, we couldn't ever. It is, if we have, if we have 100 detections of, uh, of, of uh, body parts, that's 2 to the 100 detections, 2 to the 100 possible people. I think it's way more than the number of atoms in the universe. So, uh, could never write them all down. Now, let's see. Uh, I'm going to describe this with a matrix, which again, I will never have to write down. I'm going to write down subsets of it as needed. But GDG equals 1 if person G has detection D. Now remember, exactly half of the possible people have detection D. This is the power set. Now, for any, we're also going to have access to a finite set of models defined by theta. And these terms are going to be used to associate any member of the set of possible people to a cost. I should emphasize that costs are real value, and negative terms are rewards, meaning this makes more sense. Positive terms means this makes less sense. This talk is focused on optimization, not on learning. So we're going to not discuss derivation of data. We're going to assume that's provided to us. Now, the cost of person G, and I should emphasize, this is finite. So you could say there are many models you can consider. We used a rather simple one in the paper. But you could imagine that you have one model for surfing, one model for sitting, one model for lying down. These could learn in latent ways. You could just condition on a single body part, which interacts with everybody. Lots of things you could do. But let's just take a look at what this, how we're going to associate a cost to a hypothesis or a person G. Gamma G equals minimize with respect to M in M. So again, this is a finite, finite set of M. It's easy to evaluate for any given M, and it's easy to evaluate for all of them. Theta M0, this is a, essentially enforces on prior on the number of people associated with person M, associated model M. And these are uh, positive numbers, usually, that you're trying to encourage yourself to use fewer hypotheses. Sum out over D in D, theta MD, how much sense does it make for detection D to be associated with model M? GDG, this is one if detection D is associated with person G. So that's the cost. That's, uh, this is saying how much sense does it make for detection D to be associated with a person under model M? It's like a local appearance model. This is your co-association queue. How much sense does it make for pairs of detections to be associated together? Theta M D hat D, that's co-association <coughs> under model M. GDG, is detection D associated with hypothesis G? Is detection D hat associated with hypothesis G? So for any given hypothesis, this is any given person. I call them hypotheses because it's uh, the general form, because I use all the same math to discuss cell tracking, multi person, closed estimation, multi object tracking. So I might emphasize, bring in the word hypothesis. So whenever I say hypothesis, you just say person. It says, Julian, you need to practice your lines better. You need to stop saying hypothesis. Actually, that part was practiced. So, but, uh, yes. Yeah. You're choosing each of these terms as kind of basically independent, right? Uh, but there could be some dependency, I imagine, like number of people and you know, they're including each other, uh, local appearance, so number of people might be interacting. Yeah. There are certainly things you could do. So right now, this model is just defining, it's going to be a, it's going to be a set packing formulation where the cost, where a cost of a, per, a single person is a function of the elements that make it up. You could certainly go further, include interactions, but the nice thing about this formulation, what we're going to see, uh, is that it's going to allow for really fast, efficient inference and uh, model very powerful statistics of the image. Okay, so you're like you allow for non-interactions, like you're willing to sacrifice some of the. Ideas. Of course, every every model. Uh, so right, so right now our cost term. Well, so we'll, we can let's uh, jump ahead. It's, you're just, right now on slide four. You're actually going to see our model on slide six. This is just associating a cost to any single person. Are we cool with the idea? So now uh, what we see oftentimes all over operations research is the exploitation of tree structures, exploitation of resource constrained shortest path problems. And I'm always going back to that stuff because it fascinates me. And uh, so tree structures are also very common in computer vision historically. Uh, Deborah Ramanan, uh, you know, of course, pioneered that stuff with Pedro Fels and Swab, Guttenlocker, and I'm sure it goes back further. Hopefully the people who did that first aren't watching this video. 
but we're going to use R to denote the set of body parts. And each model M <coughs> is associated with a tree over R. They can be the same tree, they can be different trees, depending on how your model theta is defined. And uh, we're going to use D to the R to denote the set of detections of body part R. Now here's the trick. Theta M D hat D is zero if D hat and D correspond to non-adjacent body parts in the tree under model M. So for this one, the left hip, the left foot, and the right foot don't talk to each other. There is no cost terms between detections that are associated with the left foot and the right foot. There is cost terms between the left uh, hand and the left elbow. So green edges define the tree model. And I would also add that theta MD is you can, so detections of a common body part also talk to each other. So two detections of a head, they both, they have cost terms between them. And you can have different cost terms associated with different model ends if you want, for pairwise uh, or not. So this is a very, very general model uh, that we can exploit. And the tree structure will come up in a, in a, you know, in a few slides, and we're going to exploit that. But it won't be obvious immediately, unless you're an OR person. But doesn't the tree structure apply to like standing people or? Oh, it does. But you can have different tree structures. You could have one person for somebody standing, one person for somebody surfing. What about sitting down or something? Yes, it does. Uh, you could have a separate tree tree model that is uh, for you can again. It doesn't have to be the same tree. It doesn't have to be the same tree over a person. You can have different structures. Yes, only three armed things. Yeah, see? Yeah. You can even get a tree model for if, depending on what your data is. We can discuss learning and latent models. I have some work on mm -hmm. on that that I've been looking to put out. So I'm actually looking for a student on that, by the way. So now let's go to the set packing formulation. And this is one of my favorite parts of the talk because this is we're getting into the operations research side. So we're going to uh, now treat the problem of finding the, 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 uh, the packing of people in the image, meaning the, how we're going to describe the image in terms of where the people are and their body positions. We're going to formulate that as a set packing formulation, and we're going to see how this gets solved with column generation. So the cool thing about column generation is column generation is used on these enormous, exponentially large uh, formulations in terms of you know, huge numbers of variables. And it's used to solve it exactly. Not uh, approximately, not like factor three, but you can do exact inference of column generation and for all sorts of problems. And it produces tighter relaxations than compact relaxations. A lot of problems in operations research you could write down as compact linear programs, but the LPs will be extremely loose, mean, in fact, meaninglessly loose. But the, comp but the column generation formulation will be extremely tight. And we see that in practice, in computer vision, just like we see it in operations research. So let's write down our objective. We're going to select the lowest total cost set of non-overlapping persons, meaning that we want to select a bunch of people, each one of which is uh, well supported by the data, but in which no two uh, selected persons share a common observation. It's a common detection of a body part. So I'm going to write that as an ILP. Uh, so gamma G is how we're going to describe to select a single person. So little gamma G equals one to select person G. Uh, so we minimize respect to little G, gamma G, sum out of a G in big G, so all possible people. Again, we could never write down this summation. So we can't, not even could we not solve this ILP, we couldn't even write it down. Big gamma G. That's the cost of hypothesis or person G, little gamma G. And then this and constraint over here says that for any given observation or any given uh, body part detection, uh, that no more than one selected person includes that detection. So that says sum out over G and G, G, D, G, does, is detection D included in person G? Little gamma G, one, if it's selected, zero otherwise, that's be less than or equal to one. So this is a set packing problem. Set packing is NP-hard. So this problem is doubly hard. First, set packing is NP-hard in general. Second, you have effectively infinite number of variables. I'm going to keep on emphasizing that point because it's very important. Now, the good news is, is that for practical problems, 
that I see in my research every day, whether that's in multi-cell tracking, whether that's in multi-person, home applications, we have one thing in common, that if I relax integrality, this stays approximately tight, meaning that gamma, that gamma G is gonna be binary anyway. You don't have to enforce it explicitly, and when you can't, we'll go uh, into that, but it's not really, and I write about that in my papers, but it's not particularly relevant for this talk, especially because over 99% of the time, these will be tight for, real, for the real problems. Uh, so I should note that we're relaxing gamma G to be non-negative, but it has to be less than or equal to one also because of that constraint. So this is an odd thing. Sure, we now have a linear program. Uh, I'm saying that it's effectively tight in practice, but I can't write it down. So what good is it? Well, as with most things, you take the Lagrangian dual, you get some insight. So I just took the dual problem. Every linear program has a primal and a dual. These are equivalent problems. When you send uh, one to C, when you send a linear program to Cplex or to Linprog or to Grovy, it gives you the primal solution and the dual solution. In the primal solution, uh, there is for, in the dual solution there is one uh, dual variable for every primal constraint, and in the primal problem there is one primal uh, uh, primal constraint for every dual variable. So they're basically they flip. So now what happens? We have a small number of variables, say 100, 200, depending on the problem for multi real for real problems. And then we have an effectively infinite number of constraints. So what do you think? Well, we can use a cutting plane method. Now, fortunately, uh, LP solvers are a good deal more efficient than that. You can add in new variables if you want um, on the fly. But in essence, this becomes a cutting plane method. Hopefully Guy de Solniers isn't watching this because he chastised me in the article I, we wrote together. He, I said, it's a cutting plane method. He said, no, Julian, don't call it that. But from my perspective, that's the best way I understand it. So what you can do is we're going to construct a small sufficient set G hat. The keyword here is sufficient set. Small sufficient set such that solving over G hat, basically putting a hat here, produces the same solution not a similar solution, not a solution within a fact or something, but the same solution as this. Pretty crazy, huh? So how would you do that? All you have to be able to do is that for any given set of dual variables lambda, you have to be able to find the most violated dual constraint. Or in fact, you need to be able to find any dual constraint if it exists. And you repeat that process until termination. Solve the problem over G hat, take your dual solution, and then, find violated constraints. So how would you do that? Well, we're going to pricing by, if they call the process of finding violated dual constraints, also called primal variables with negative reduced cost, uh, pricing. It comes from its uh, origin in operations research. So what we're going to do is we condition on M. So we're going to iterate over all the M, which is not that many. And then we're going to find the lowest reduced cost person associated with model M. And we're going to convert this to an integer program. So I just write down, this is the reduced cost, basically means how violated that dual constraint is. And I wrote it in terms of theta, lambda, and the pairwise thetas. This is just the, this term here is just the cost of a, of a primal variable under, uh, under model M with the theta M0, the offset cost just removed. So I don't need it, it's constant. So I need to be able to solve this. So I just rewrite this as an integer program, replacing GDG with QD, and QD equals one if GDG is one. So this is an ILP, or an IP. You can turn it to an integer linear program by linearizing this term, but we're not going to because of the tree structure, and that's where we're gonna see where that comes from next. But I want us to provide some, some understanding. Whenever I look at a linear program, I always try to understand what is the dual saying? Because the primal is often intuitive. We understand, we, we made the primal. Of course it's intuitive. But the dual is not. The dual kind of looks like black magic. Like, well, what's lambda? Where does it come from? What does it mean? So I like to give some intuition about this. Lambda is a principled feedback mechanism. It says where not to look. So values that have big, I guess, well, fig and magnitude, lambda d values, are 
the observations or body part detections that are well explained by the current model. And ones that have a small lambda d, so a lambda d close to zero, means that it's not uh, particularly well explained. That's one way of understanding it. There's the concept of degeneracy, but this is very helpful. And I think of this in the following manner. I think this is a very great way of understanding what's going on. And again, I want to emphasize that this is, what I'm about to say is not neuroscience. This is an analogy. Maybe there's some neuroscience basis. I doubt it. I do know that there are lots of connections between the uh, higher layers of the brain and the lower layers. So maybe there is some truth here, indeed. But certainly that's not where I'm going at. I'm going to go at this from the perspective of providing some intuition. I think about this problem, also, uh, this master problem, and if you're restricting over some G hat, they're called the restricted master problem, as the higher layers of the brain. This reasoning about, given these hypotheses of people, these person candidates that I've generated so far, how do I fit them together like a jigsaw puzzle? And then this over here is saying, where are, is looking for people that make sense to add in. But how do I know which, how do I know how the higher layers of the brain should interact with the layers of the brain that are exploring for people in the, in the actual image itself? They talk via these dual variables, and they talk in this principled manner. It's not like you have to tune these dual variables. This is, you know, the dual linear programming solver gives you their values. And this is very interesting. It's this very fascinating way of understanding what the dual problem is doing. So it's providing you prices, essentially, for how much it wants you not to use uh, detections, meaning detections that are well explained by the current uh, set of people generated. This, however, does not exploit the tree structure. And so if he doesn't, then this would be a, uh, a binary, integer pro binary integer programming problem, which uh, will be rough for larger problem instances. But people do have this tree structure. So when I think trees, I think dynamic programming. For those uh, here, very closely related with the Turby algorithm. The Turby algorithm is a dynamic programming problem. And the USC College of Engineering is named after Andrew Viterbi. So there's a USC connection here. So pricing by a dynamic program given M. Now, I don't want you to think that you have to go through and understand these equations. And it's like, ah, you see these big fancy equations. It's like, I can't follow that. Just remember, this is a dynamic program. And the tree, the nodes of this tree are the body parts. And the edges indicate adjacency. Remember, this is pricing given M, given your model. Because you're going to you're iterate over M, you apply a dynamic program for each. We're going to use S to the R to denote the power set of D to the R. This is the set of all possible head detections, the set of all possible uh, left foot detections, and so forth. While I cannot enumerate all possible people, I can enumerate the power set of any given body part. So let's say there, there are maybe, say, 10 left hands. 15 right legs, you can always enumerate the, the relevant subset for any given body part. Uh, so we describe that with this matrix S. S to the R DS is equals 1 indicates that D is in configuration S for body part R. Now we have our dynamic programming constraints. And this part right here, I think this is perhaps a good place to start. This is describing for body part R, given that his parent S hat takes on, R hat takes on S hat as his configuration, so we know what the parent is doing. We have all the inter pairwise interaction terms with the parent, so those are your green theta terms, plus the cost to go. Every dynamic program has your, your cost to go, right? <clears throat> and this is this new to the R underscore S is just the cost of the subtree rooted at R. Uh, given that uh, part R takes on value S. So this term right here, this looks scary. This is just all the pair of all the interactions within part S, with, with uh, associated part R. And that's what's going on here, all your pairwise terms. And then this is your unary terms, your, your, uh, your terms over uh, the individual detections, over pairs. And then this is your dual variables. They come right back. And then we have over here, then this is the mu terms for the children. And you see these two are the same. Makes your tree structure. 
So I wouldn't focus too much on the fact that memorizing what these equations are. Uh, but what I would focus on is just the concept that given that you have a person, given the model M that you've selected, that, that, it, that pricing is a dynamic program. Is that clear for everybody? So this is my favorite part of the talk. So I'm uh, really passionate about dual optimal inequalities. And dual optimal inequalities are a way of accelerating column generation. Uh, we can bound the dual values from below without loosening the relaxation. So we're going to somehow get these bounds on the dual variables. We're going to say where the dual solution lies. And we're going to do it in such a way that we don't alter the optimality. We're not going to weaken our, weaken our relaxation. But we are going to speed up optimization dramatically. I've had papers where, like my work on planar ultrametrics, where the injection of dual optimal inequalities takes the problem from not working at all to being done in fractions of a second. You can get thousands of times speed up by having good dual optimal inequalities. And something I've devoted a lot of time into. Uh, you can look at one of my recent papers in 2019, where I look at uh, flexible dual optimal inequalities, which is a new class of dual optimal inequality we developed. Uh, but let's, let's begin. Let's just pretend that some oracle, we'll get where this oracle, we'll get these values from. Let's just pretend that some oracle gave us for every single uh, d, some value chi d, such that not there exists a dual optimal solution, which is inside this space, is permitted. So you have these dual variables they, that, that are bound in that, inside these big chi d terms. And I'm going to tell you that the, this constraint does not loosen the LP because this oracle gave it to us. Let's see what happens when I take the dual problem and I convert it to the primal. Well, I make, uh, I make the notes to the changes in colors. So big chi d is a, is a constant, as you already know. And little chi d is essentially counting how many times you violated the packing constraint. And the primal interpretation is you pay pi d or chi d per overlap. Every time you overlap uh, d, so basically include d more than once, you're going to have to pay chi d, big chi d. And chi d, big chi d, <coughs> is greater than or equal to, we usually add a tiny constant, so it's always greater than, the increase in the cost of a person incurred by removing detection d. So, Basically, what this means is that by removing detection D from any person, you will increase the cost of that person by no more than chi D. And this is a, uh, we produce this value using a uh, worst case analysis. It's very fast to do. And we have uh, the flexible dual optimal inequalities give tighter values. Varying dual optimal inequalities give uh, tighter values. And those are studied in our 2019 work. But this has a different interpretation. This allows you to say that you can express subsets of G hats, perhaps it's a bad word, uh, with distorted costs. Imagine you take any member of G hat, so some G, and then pull out some detections from that. Uh, you can now express that new uh, person that you generated using uh, your current G hat, but it would be expressed with additional cost beyond what it would normally be. So, it's essentially allowing you to represent phantom people. You don't phantom phantom people in your G hat, which is a really cool idea. And I wrote down the equation here in case for the invariant invariant DOIs. Uh, this is just all I'm doing over here is I'm adding all of the negative terms together, all the reward terms that are associated with detection D. I'm adding them all together to get myself an upper bound on how much it could can be incurred by removing D not including any of the positive terms, which of course would, which would be removed by removing detection D, just all of the possible negative terms, maximizing over model M. And of course, I should put a, a max over uh, zero comma, so to ensure that uh, chi is not negative. But I didn't draw that down there because it takes up too much space. But eventually, we're just providing a, this is how much damage you could do by removing detection D, an upper bound on it. Easy to evaluate one. Tighter analysis exists, but this gets at the intuition that removing any one detection from a person is probably not going to alter the cost of that person very much. Removing any one, just like removing 
any one uh, pickup location from a vehicle route probably is not going to make the, a big difference in the cost of that route. Maybe, but as a general rule, it won't. And the key thing here is that these bounds will ensure that there exists a dual optimal solution to the original problem that is still dual optimal for the new problem. That's very important. So this is a free lunch, basically. So uh, how am I doing for time? 15 minutes to go. So that was the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk is a little bit harder, if only because the exposition is not as strong. But uh, do my best, and uh, hopefully this goes well. So for most of the problems, about 90% of the problems in our data set, we can do dynamic programming, as you saw, for pricing with no issue. In fact, if you're willing to wait a little while, then you can do it for all the problems. But there can, we can speed this up quite a bit, uh, 500 times speed up, and this speed up gets bigger as the uh, problem size gets bigger. So yeah, here's why, where the problem comes up. For our problems, you don't tend to have more than 20 detections of any given body part in an image. And 20 is kind of the upper bound for how many we can evaluate. That's 2 to the 20. So you could evaluate for any given body part, you could evaluate 2 to the 20 configurations. But imagine you had a left, 20 left elbows and then 20 left hands. Well, then you have 2 to the 40 possibilities that you would have to go over during your dynamic programming. And that'd be a rough thing to do. 2 to the 40 is a trillion. So we can't do that. But I know I could do 2 to the 20. I could do 2 to the 10. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce these terms. going to lower bound mu r s hat as being with this term at a minus here, as being a max of a set of affine functions of s hat. Notice that we're going to evaluate mu r s hat without considering the child, the children. This is pretty crazy, huh? You're going to do dynamic programming without considering the children. You're just going to make it an affine function of the parent. And this is your offset of this particular, I guess, the max, the maximum of a set of affine functions. And then this is saying, of course, does uh, body part r hat use detection d hat? under configuration S hat, S hat, hat being for the parent, no hat being for the child. And over here, we do the exact same thing for new, and we have the grandchild. Size are always easy to evaluate. So the goal is to construct small sets z to the r, that z to the r, that z to the r, same thing, such that you get the exact provable optimal solution to the dynamic program, and you know you did. So just like in this uh, previously, with column generation, we terminate uh, column generation when there are no negative reduced cost terms over here, and then we have the optimal solution, and we know we have the optimal solution. Then similar thing over here. We're going to construct these, uh, these uh, new sets so that we have the optimal solution, and we know we have the optimal solution. It's very important that, and this is not going to be time intensive. This is two to the number of configurations of the parent, say two to the 20 times, on well, practice, 30. And this is 2 to the 20 is kind of rare. Usually it's more like 2 to the 15. So this is, or 2 to the 10. So this is very tractable for us to do. And the key thing that we take advantage of is that mu to the r s hat changes smoothly in s hat as you alter given, uh, include or exclude given observations or given body parts from s, from s hat. You're going to smoothly change what this value is. So we, that's, what, that's where the power of this method comes from. So for now, I want you to imagine a universe where people consist of left, hand, left elbows and left hands. And you know that's not how people are, but it's going to help us understand this slide. And this slide is, uh, you don't have to, you could, you, could, you could pretend I didn't say that last line, but it's, it's helpful to me to at least say that. So now I'm going to show how to make a tight cut, how to make your next, how to make a bender's cut, what they call those new terms. I should oh, say bender's uh, is for jock bender's, uh, not 1962. It has nothing to do with the human body. It's kind of a funny. People, I talk about bender's decomposition. For multi-person pose estimation, people think I'm making a pun. Just happened to turn out that way. 
So I'm making a tight cut uh, given S hat. I'm going to write down the primal problem, uh, what the optimal decision is for S uh, for the child S. And this seems to have nothing at all to do with making those uh, vendors cuts, those omega terms. You're like, why am I seeing this? So, but we're going to see. We're going to use XS, which is a binary variable, to select the configuration for the child R. And we're going to express the, the, uh, this term, you know, the parent-child interaction, with YD hat D. And I write this as an LP. And we'll see what these terms say. This is your parent-child interaction terms. This is the reduced cost of the remainder of the trade. This constraint over here in blue says one configuration for the child is chosen. And this constraint in red, these three constraints, all they do is enforce this. It's just a fancy schmancy way of writing that. This is a provably tight LP by a total unimodularity. So given that S hat is, of course, known, this is a uh, easy to solve problem effect. But it doesn't tell us anything about a vendor's cut. Nothing at all. However, I'm going to take the Lagrangian dual and look what happens. I get, I get in this term, as in red, looks exactly of, this, of the form that you would get for the vendor's form. So these terms right here, I'm just going to call any, this particular vendor's row that we just generated, call it Z. These guys are your omega Z D hats, and these are constants, and these are your omega Z zeros. Uh, there's a concept of Pareto optimality in Bender's decomposition. Uh, it's called a Maganenti Wong uh, property. And basically, it never benefits you to set your uh, lambda ones and your lambda twos be bigger than, uh, than they would have to be otherwise. So you're, you're going to choose the lowest, the, bend, the bender's cut that is optimal in the sense that it maximizes this objective given fixed S hat, but minimizes that norm. And this is actually an extremely easy problem to solve. It is not the bottleneck of our algorithm. I predicted their viewers would make that mistake. They actually didn't. I certainly thought it would be. Now, I just want to go over what the iteration is in a world of just uh, elbows and hands, although it's the exact same iteration for uh, when it's not, that's not the case, as we'll see in the next slide. We're going to select the configuration for the parent, which is the root. We'll call it uh, with child R. So we're going to minimize with respect to the configuration for the parent, given your current sets ZR, which you just say initialize to be empty. Let's add in ZR that just is unbinding, non-binding just. And then once you have your S hat fixed, you generate yourself a new dual cut using the, using the solution from last time, last slide. And then you repeat this process until convergence. It kind of reminds you of coordinate descent, but it's not, it's globally optimal. So it's kind of like coordinate descent and kind of not. So now let's see how this goes for the entire uh, uh, product. So going from for the entire process. So you start at the root, say the root's your head, and then you go down through your body, and with that you make a greedy choice at each step because you know what your parent S hat um, S hats is doing. And then you go from the leaves to the root, uh, increasing, augmenting your Z to the R terms, thus increasing your new to R minus and mu to the R minus. And this is a cool thing. I actually, I don't know the name of this technique in operations research. I'm sure it exists, I just don't know its name. Uh, we can basically increase the offsets, the omega uh, Z zeros, which are by altering the omega, by altering the delta Z zeros, basically those was one of the constants in the, uh, the Maganati Wong, by just setting it to the maximum feasible value as the news change. So as the, as the news change, you can increase your delta zeros. You can also recycle the, the, uh, the Z terms across iterations. You just have to alter your uh, delta zero terms. So it's an iterative process. You go down, uh, making decisions greedily, and then go up, adding vendors rows. And then this will, when this terminates, and it terminates very quickly, uh, you have the optimal solution, and you know you have the optimal solution. And again, it's important that you can recycle the Z to the R between calls to pricing. That means that the first time you call pricing, 
for your first iteration of column generation, you don't have any uh, column, any, any vendor's rows. But by the time you've done this 10 times, you have a lot of vendor's rows. So they, each call of pricing is cheaper than the previous one, which is a nice property. So in the real problems, uh, I'm gonna go over our results. So this is first, we have some uh, visual results. I'm now gonna show you how much of a difference nested vendors makes. So each data point here shows on the, is associated with a problem instance. Time to solve that entire problem instance using uh, where we're doing pricing by dynamic programming. And then this is the factor speed up that you get by using by doing pricing by nested vendors decomposition. As you can see over here, you know, you're getting say when it takes about 10 seconds to do, uh, to solve a problem instance by dynamic programming when you're doing pricing. Over here, it takes it down so you solve the entire column generation process in one second. What about over here? Well, over here, it takes about 2,000 seconds to solve this particular complete problem instance. But if you're doing pricing via nested vendors decomposition, you get yourself a factor speed up of 500. Pretty cool, huh? So let's, uh, let's uh, column generation takes, uh, when using doing pricing via nested vendors, takes about 1.95 seconds on average. We could actually speed this up quite a bit now, but that was the number I had off of these slides. In 99%, I guess the over 90 hours, 99.5% of cases, the LP is tight. So meaning that we got the right solution and we know we got the right solution because when you solve the primal problem at the end of column generation, it gives you a binary value solution. For the remaining cases, the integrality gap is less than 1.5% and usually much less than that. Uh, relative to the baseline, we are better at localizing uh, the extremities of the body parts. Uh, we actually stole our cost terms uh, from Bjorn Andres, uh, which were kind of like, uh, you can kind of think of how I get my cost terms in the same way that some sea creatures get their shells. You know, there's some sea creatures that make their own shells, and there's some sea creatures that just steal them. I love Bjorn's work. He's awesome. But I stole his cost terms, and I used them for a different problem, much like uh, some sea creatures use somebody else's shell for a different problem. That's kind of the way to think about what I did for these cost terms. We can go into greater depth on how we can learn them in a future talk. So I want to go summarize the, our talk. Our goal is to pack detections of body parts to form people. The quality of a person is a quadratic function of his members parameterized by the model. We're going we to formulate this as a set packing problem and attack with column generation. You could formulate this as a compact LP, but the relaxation would be very loose and it would take forever to solve. And give you meaningless solutions. Uh, we attack pricing by dynamic programming. Dual model inequalities exist. Uh, and the same dual model inequalities that we write about in our recent papers can be used in this case also. Uh, the solution is tight in general, but you could tighten it with branch and price, which is the process where you're doing branch and bound, except you can't branch on the variables in the extended formulation, but you can branch on the variables in the corresponding compact formulations we didn't cover. But it's the same concept from operations research. And then also with subset row inequalities, which our operations research audience would know, uh, if any operations future people come watch. But essentially what that would say is that the number of people that include two or more observations from any group of three observations is bounded by one, not one and a half. And you could do higher order versions of that. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you got as much out of this as I did giving it to you. Thanks so much. I'm happy to take any questions. You don't need any training data? Do you can just run it over images? Uh, so we got our problem instances from Bjorn Andres and then adapted his cost terms for a uh, related, very closely related problem to our problem. Right, but you don't have like traditional, like you don't need people to, to draw, like to create the training data set. Uh, that's, he did that. Oh, he did, he did that. that, he did that, yes. So you, have to, you still have to have a traditional uh, training data set. in order to get your theta terms, but not, not for solving the optimization. So the optimization and the learning are separated. And have you applied it to like videos? Uh, so we did uh, related work on multi-object tracking, uh, and we did related work for, uh, on biological cells tracking too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know, no. So we actually, the, a column in that case corresponds to a complete description of a person as they move across space time.
you should try to analyze some novel, you know, for example, dancing. You know, to, to, no, I'm sure nobody has really looked at I would love to. Uh, in your talk, you never you you use the the cost of putting the tree to the object in, in your talk, but you talk about what is that value? Uh, these because it's not your. I understand your work was the optimization part, not the defining the. Cost. Yes. So these data terms would come from uh, the learning mechanism, which is a separate talk. Mm -hmm. Something else you did not. Yes. No. So it's, the stated terms come from a uh, separate talk, separate uh, paper. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. How'd I do? Oh, thank you. Yes. Get anything out of the talk? Uh, so I come from a biomedical engineering background. Side. Uh, particularly about video. Um, Momentum of movement plays in. Uh, we wrote a paper for the for biological cell tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at AI Stats 2017. I don't think we pulled the cell experiments. From it. Certainly, we had an archive report, and uh, we may, have, may or may not have pulled the cell experiments from that uh, to make the AI Stats paper. But that's uh, we have cost terms that are defined uh, over the motions of the cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the cell over. Yeah, so we use a learning mechanism to learn the cost term. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just trying to think of this in a, actually talked to Satish about this. Um, we were talking about self-driving cars and uh, being able to predict when you can't stop in time. Where could 